Purgatory, Chapter 9 The Pains of Purgatory, Their Nature, Their Rigor, Doctrine of Theologians, Bellarmine, St. Francis of Sales, Fear and Confidence. There is in purgatory, as in hell, a double pain, the pain of loss and the pain of sense. The pain of loss consists of being deprived for a time of the sight of God, who is the supreme good, the beatific end for which our souls are made, as our eyes are for the light. It is a moral thirst which torments the soul. The pain of sense, or sensible sufferings, is the same that which we experience in our flesh. Its nature is not defined by faith, but it is the common opinion of the doctors that it consists in fire and other species of suffering. The fire of purgatory, says the fathers, is that of hell, of which the rich glutton speaks. I suffer, he says, cruelly in these flames. As regards the severity of these pains, since they are inflicted by infinite justice, they are proportioned to its nature, gravity, and number of sins committed. Each one receives according to his works. Each one must acquit himself of the debt, that which he has himself charged before God. Now these debts differ greatly in quality, some of which have accumulated during a long period. Others reach the ten thousands talents, of which the gospel, that is to say, millions and tens of millions, while with others reduced to a few farlings, the trifling remainder of that which has not been expiated on earth. It falls from this that the souls undergo various kind of sufferings, that there are innumerable degrees of expiation in purgatory, and that some are incomparably more severe than others. However speaking, in general, the doctors agree in saying that the pains are most excruciating. The same fire, says St. Gregory, torments the damned and purifies the elect. Almost all theologians, says Bellarmine, teach that the reprobate and the souls in purgatory suffer the actions of the same fire. It must be held as certain, writes the same Bellarmine, that there is no proportion between the sufferings of this life and those of purgatory. St. Augustine declares precisely the same in his commentary on Psalm 31. Lord, he says, chastise me not in thy wrath, and reject me not with those to whom you said, Go into eternal fire, but chastise me in thy anger. Purify me rather in such a manner in this life that I need not to be purified by fire in the next. Yes, I fear that fire which has been enkindled for those who will be saved, it is true, but yet so as by fire. 1 Corinthians 3.15 They will be saved, no doubt, after the trial of fire, but that trial will be terrible. That torment will be more intolerable than all the most excruciating sufferings in this world. Behold what St. Augustine says and what St. Gregory, Venerable Bede, St. Anselm, and St. Bernard have said after him. St. Thomas goes on even further. He maintains that the least pain of purgatory surpasses all the sufferings of this life, whatsoever they may be. Pain, says Blessed Peter Lefebvre, is deeper and more acute when it directly attacks the soul and the mind than when it reaches them only through the medium of the body. The mortal body and the senses themselves absorb and intercept a part of the physical, even of moral pain. Their author imitation explains this doctrine by a practical and striking sentence, speaking in general of these sufferings of the other life. There is, he says, one hour of torment will be more terrible than a hundred years of rigorous penance done here. To prove this doctrine, it is affirmed that all the souls of purgatory suffer the pain of loss. Now this pain surpasses the keenest suffering, but to speak of the pain of sense alone, we know what a terrible thing of fire is, how feeble soever the flame which we enkindle in our houses, and what pain is caused by the slightest burn. How much more terrible must be that fire, which is fed neither by wood nor oil, 
but which can never be extinguished, enkindled by the breath of God to be instrument of his justice. It seizes upon the soul and torments them with incomparable activity. That which we have already said, in what we still have to say, will be qualified to inspire us with that solitary fear recommended to us by Jesus Christ. But lest certain readers forget of the Christian confidence, which must temper our fear, should give themselves to excessive fear, let us modify the preceding doctrine by that of another doctor of the Church, St. Francis of Sales who presents the sufferings of purgatory, soothed by the consolations which accompany them. We may, says this holy and amiable director of souls, draw from the thoughts of purgatory more consolation than apprehension. The greater part of those who dread purgatory so much think more of their own interests than those of the interests of God's glory. This proceeds from the fact that they only think of the suffering without considering the peace and happiness which are there enjoyed by the holy souls. It is true that the torments are so great that the most acute sufferings of this life bear no comparison to them, but the interior satisfaction which is there enjoyed is such that no prosperity nor contentment on earth can equal it. The souls are in continual union with God. They are perfectly resigned to His will, or rather, their will is so transformed into that of God that they cannot but will what God wills, so that if paradise were to be open to them, they would precipitate themselves into hell rather than to appear before God with the stains with which they see themselves defigured. They purify themselves willfully and lovingly, because such is the divine good pleasure. They wish to be there in the state wherein God pleases, and as long as it shall please him, they cannot sin, nor can they experience the least movement of impatience, nor commit the slightest imperfection. They love God more than they love themselves, and more than all things else. They love him with a perfect, pure, and disinterested love. They are consoled by angels. They are assured by their eternal salvation, and filled with a hope that can never be disappointed in its expectations. Their bitterest anguish is soothed by a certain profound peace. It is a species of hell as regards the suffering. It is a paradise as regards the delight infused into their hearts by charity. Charity stronger than death and more powerful than hell. Charity whose lamps are all fire and all flame. Happy state, continues the bishop, more desirable than appalling since its flames are flames of love and charity. Such are the teachings of the doctors, from which it follows that if the pains of purgatory are rigorous, they are not without consolation. When imposing his cross upon us in this life, God pours upon it the unction of his grace, and in purifying the soul in purgatory like gold in the crucible. He tempers their flames by ineffable consolations. We must not lose sight of this consoling element, this bright sight of the often gloomy picture which we are going to examine. Purgatory, Chapter 10 Pains of Purgatory The Pain of Loss St. Catherine of Genoa St. Teresa Father Nuremberg After having heard the theologians and doctors of the Church, let us listen to doctors of another kind. They are saints who speak of the sufferings of the other life, and who relate that God has made known to them by supernatural communication. St. Catherine of Genoa, in her treatise on purgatory, says, The souls endure a torment so extreme that no tongue can describe it, nor could the understanding conceive the least notion of it, if God did not make it known by a particular grace. No tongue, she adds, can express, no mind, form any idea of what purgatory is. As to the suffering, it is equal to that of hell. St. Teresa in the Castle of the Soul, speak of the pain of loss, 
expresses itself thus. The pain of loss, or the privation of the sight of God, exceeds all the most excruciating sufferings we can imagine, because the souls urge on towards God, as to the center of their aspiration, are continually repulsed by His justice. Picture to yourself a shipwrecked mariner who, after having long battled the waves, comes at least within reach of the shore, only to find himself thrust back by an invisible hand. What torturing agonies! Yet those of the souls in purgatory are a thousand times greater. Father Nuremberg of the Company of Jesus who died in the odor of sanctity at Madrid in 1658, relates a fact that occurred at Travis, and which was recognized, says Father Rasangali, by the vicar general of the diocese as possessing all the characteristics of truth. At the Feast of All the Saints, a young girl of rare piety saw appear before her a lady of her acquaintance, who had died some time previous. The apparition was clad in white, with a veil of the same color on her head, and holding in her hand a long rosary, a token of the tender devotion she had always professed towards the Queen of Heaven. She implored the charity of her pious friend, saying that she had made a vow to have three masses celebrated at the altar of the Blessed Virgin, and that, not having been able to accomplish her vow, this debt added to her sufferings. She then begged her to pray it in her place. The young person willingly granted the alms asked of her, and when the three masses had been celebrated, the deceased again appeared, expressing her joy and gratitude. She even continued to appear each month of November, and almost always in the church. Her friends saw her there in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, overwhelmed with the awe of which nothing can give any idea. Not yet being able to see God face to face, she seemed to wish to indemnify herself by contemplating him at least under the Eucharistic species. During the holy sacrifice of the Mass, at the moment of the elevation, her face became so radiant that she might have been taken away for a seraph descended from heaven. The young girl, filled with admiration, declared that she had never seen anything so beautiful. Meanwhile, time passed, and notwithstanding the masses and prayers offered for her, that holy soul remained in her exile, far from the eternal tabernacles. On December 3rd, feast of St. Francis Xavier, her protectress, going to receive communion at the Church of the Jesuits, the apparition accompanied her to the holy table, and then accompanied at her side during the whole time of thanksgiving as though to participate in the happiness of the Holy Communion and enjoy the presence of Jesus Christ. On December 8th, Feast of the Immaculate Conception, she again returned, but so brilliant that her friend could not look at her. She visibly approached the term of her expiation. Finally, on December 10th, during Holy Mass, she appeared in a still more wonderful state, after making a profound genuflection before the altar, she thanked the pious girl for her prayers and rose to heaven in company with her guardian angel. Some time previous, this holy soul had made known that she suffered nothing more than the pain of loss for the privation of God. But she added that the privation caused her intolerable torture. This revelation justifies the words of St. John Chrysostom in his 47th homily. Imagine, he says, all the torments of the world. You will not find one equal to the privation of the beatific vision of God. In fact, the torture of the pain of loss, of which we now treat, is according to all the saints and all the doctors much more acute than the pains of sense. It is true that, in the present life, we cannot understand this, because we have too little knowledge of the sovereign good for which we are created. But in the other life, that ineffable good seems to the soul what bread is to the man famished with hunger, or fresh water to the one dying of thirst. Like health to a sick person, 
tortured by long sufferings. It excites the most ardent desires, which torments without being able to satisfy them.